Never consume food that's kept uh, too long after ordering anyway. Throw it out. Biggest mistake I've seen, um, at least uh, people I know uh, do, saying that, you know, we can't put warm or hot food in the refrigerator. It's perfectly okay. For those uh, who consume non-vegetarian foods, please keep separate cutting boards and utensils for non-vegetarian and vegetarian food. If I go into an unfamiliar place with a lot of people, I would not pick the most exotic, rarely ordered item on their menu. First question to you is, what are the first symptoms that we should notice once the first signs of food poisoning? The signs of food poisoning are uh, fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Now, not all of them need to be present in the same person. So, some people may just get vomiting, others may uh, get diarrhea, and others may feel cramps. Some get all of them. So, these are the symptoms. And if these if the symptoms are severe, you ought to um, get uh, to the hospital uh, or at least seek medical attention. For the milder symptoms, really there is no need to be admitted to hospital. But if there is dehydration, for example, if we are vomiting or if we are having uh, diarrhea, uh, we may lose a significant part of our intravascular fluid volume. Now in English, that means the amount of fluid in our body. Uh, that can suddenly drop and this is particularly true for older people and for uh, younger children um, and uh, this can lead to a drop in blood pressure and even lead to complications such as a clot in the brain or uh, if a shutdown of the kidneys so now uh, i don't mean to be scary but these are complications and as a doctor i ought to uh, discuss these complications and they have occurred when people have opted to stay at home and take home remedies in spite of having severe symptoms. But uh, what are the immediate steps to take once you notice these symptoms before you go to a hospital? The immediate steps would be uh, to seek medical attention. So contact whoever your healthcare provider is, your family doctor, and uh, have a word with them. You, uh, of course, this is 2022 and we can uh, access our healthcare provider through the phone. In many instances, you can talk with them. And they may ask you to come down to the clinic or walk down to the hospital or to the nearest casualty uh, where they will check the vital signs, uh, which include blood pressure, pulse, oxygen saturation and uh, level of hydration, which the doctor can, or nurse can assess by examining you. Um, on the phone, it is hard to assess all of these factors. Uh, for example, if there's a high heart rate and a low blood pressure and the uh, total fluid volume is low in the body, the patient requires to be urgently infused with intravenous fluids uh, and electrolytes. It is not just the loss of fluids that matters, it's also the loss of electrolytes. Basically, these are salts that are present in our body, which can be sodium, potassium, magnesium, and also other electrolytes such as chloride. If we lose them, our pH or acid, acid base balance can go for a toss. So, uh, back to your question, uh, these are the things that we must look for. and. Uh, uh, I would pay attention to continuing symptoms, particularly vomiting. Many people think that if they pop a pill, uh, the symptoms will settle down. Remember, a pill is only as good, um, only good if it stays inside the stomach. If for someone who's continuously vomiting, taking uh, a pill by mouth is not going to cut it. So those are some practical points that we must keep in mind. Bottom line is, if symptoms are persisting, stay in the hospital for at least for an overnight admission with IV fluids. And uh, we've seen a few cases in Kerala now. Um, so why does it affect some people more than it affects another person? That's an excellent question. I get that all the time as a gastroenterologist. Now, um, gastroenterologists basically are doctors who specialize in the in the gut, which means the stomach, intestines, and the digestive system, liver, gallbladder, all of that. 
Now, um, many of us have uh, worked in um, a relatively new part of gastroenterology, which is the gut immunity. Gut immunity is basically, um, see, we have uh, immunity over our nose and throat. We know about the COVID pandemic, which comes in through the nose and our throats into the lungs. Uh, there are other organisms that get in through the skin. And then there are other organisms that get in through the gut. So um, our gut is an important barrier with the outside world. Even though we appear to take food internally, it is still technically outside the body, if you know what I mean. So until it crosses the barrier of the gut and enters our circulation, enters our blood circulation or our tissues, the food we eat is technically still outside the body. I know it's a little difficult to comprehend that food. The food that we eat is technically outside the body. It really is because until it's absorbed into our body. Now, there uh, lies the answer to your question, because the way we handle uh, food or infectious agents or other, uh, say, viruses, bacteria, etc., are quite different. Um, there's variation between individuals. Now, collectively, we can use the term gut immunity for that. Now, gut immunity for us gastroenterologists uh, is composed largely of a substantial number of bacteria that live in our guts. So if you take two two human beings on the planet, no two people will have the same gut bacteria. In terms of numbers, the number of our bacteria exceeds the total number of cells in our body. Now, these are not uh, harmful, dangerous bacteria. These are friendly bacteria that guard, in one sense, our army, uh, guard our, let's say, the, the wall of our fortress. Um, and then uh, there, is other, there are other aspects of our immune system. For example, the IgA levels, the specialized uh, uh, type of antibodies that guard these areas. They're called IgAs. And uh, the IgA profile of different individuals are different. Depends on what we are exposed to, uh, what our HLA genetic makeup is. And that's a little technical there. But suffice to say that no two people have the same immune system. Uh, no two people uh, have the same immune memory. So, um, and the other aspect is no two people ha are taking in the same exact load of bacteria or viruses. Say, for example, uh, a person eats a grilled chicken, which is contaminated at a restaurant, a roadside restaurant. Another person um, t um, orders the same food, but eats it six hours later. Guess who will be more severely affected? The second person. Why? Because when this, um, when food, food substances sit on room temperature, if they are contaminated prior, I repeat, if they are previously contaminated, that contamination can escalate to such a level that trillions of bacteria can emerge uh, in, in just a few hours. The longer food sits, that's an important message for our viewers, uh, do not keep food for too long after ordering the food, particularly if it contains meat. And if you expect a delay, an unexpected delay um, after ordering, I would put it in the refrigerator and warm it well before uh, or, or heat it uh, well before consuming it and uh, never consume food that's kept uh, too long after ordering anyway throw it out so is it a bad idea to uh, keep your food in the refrigerator and use it again the next day yeah that's a that's a long that's a long uh, that's a long answer uh, that, that we need to that's a long topic okay so first for our viewers let me break this down in simple terms we are concerned with harmful bacteria which may or may not be present in the food we order. If the, if the restaurant is clean, if they are uh, adhering to basic hygiene standards, which we will come to later in this discussion, I hope, the food is safe. Don't worry about it. Remember, ordering food is safe as long as they are practicing what are standard measures. We are talking about a handful of rogue establishments who are not adhering to established standards and their food is contaminated and the discussion here is specifically limited to those. Now, it is those foods that I said that A, don't order them and B, if by some chance we order them, must consume immediately because the longer, longer we make it sit, it will multiply. Bacteria love temperatures between four and 60 degrees, six zero. Now, the refrigerator or the fridge keeps uh, food at temperatures below four degrees. Remember the shelf of our, the regular shelf of our refrigerator, as long as we keep it closed. Remember a refrigerator that's open all the time is not gonna keep temperature. So let's assume this refrigerator is kept closed. Yes, if you keep food on the shelf, 
it will be four degrees or below, which means that any bacteria in the food will not be able to multiply. But the moment we take it out and keep it out on the kitchen counter or on the dining table, it rapidly increases to room temperatures, which, which may be 28 or 32 degrees uh, in Indian conditions. Bacteria, bacteria love to multiply in those conditions, regardless of what uh, species they are, whether they're harmful or harmless, they all multiply. So the bacterial count increases and so does a toxin count. Uh, for example, bacteria like Staphylococcus, Clostridium and Bacillus cereus. These are three bacteria that are notorious for producing toxins. So it's not just the bacteria that we're dealing with, we're also dealing with the poisons that they produce, which contaminate the food. So back to your question about uh, keeping food in the fridge. Yes, the fridge is a blessing in terms of keeping food. Uh, but I would, if you're, if you're cooking at home, let's switch to home cooking now. If you're cooking at home, the idea, in the ideal world, the utopian world, cook just what you need for that particular day. But in the real world, that is not possible. Many of us are working, uh, uh, the, our partners are working. Uh, there, there, aren't, there aren't enough options to get uh, freshly cooked food for every meal, like it may have been the case uh, a few decades ago. So uh, if we are cooking for more than uh, a day, the correct thing to do is take the portions that we need for the day and separate the ones, separate the portions that we need for tomorrow. Move it immediately to the fridge. Many people would think, oh my God, should I not let it cool down? Yes, that's where we got it all wrong. The CDC, the, the US CDC and various other um, established health authorities have said it's perfectly safe to move warm food into the refrigerator. Yes. So that is the biggest mistake I've seen, um, at least uh, people I know uh, do saying that, you know, we can't put warm or hot food in the refrigerator. It's perfectly okay. But keep it in smaller containers. Let the steam out first before you move it in. So I wouldn't take it directly off the stove and put it in the fridge. I would keep, I would let it cool off just a little bit, let the steam out. So as soon as the steam stops coming, keep it in a smaller uh, bowl and keep it in the refrigerator. And it will be safe for next day's consumption. Uh, the alternative is, uh, let's say we, uh, we eat what we need and uh, at night we come and check what are the leftovers and then we, we put them in the fridge. That's what commonly people do. I would not recommend that. Most often we get away with it, I know, but it is technically not uh, safe. And one other thing uh, for home cooking, which I would advise is use for those uh, who consume non-vegetarian foods, please keep separate cutting boards and utensils for non-vegetarian and vegetarian food. Why do I say that? Because meat or fish may contain, as I said, at source, food can be contaminated. Where chicken is slaughtered, yes, it's very, very easy for the meat to be contaminated. And you just have to w walk into a livestock market to, to, know, uh, to know what I'm talking about. Uh, so in the, in the real world, yes, meat could easily be contaminated. And if we cut meat using a scissors, a pair of scissors or a knife, the bacteria on the chicken are gonna enter the knife or the scissors. And if we use the same instrument, to cut, say, onions or tomatoes or salads. Yes, these bacteria are going to get onto that, and they're all they're all uh, they're also going to sit on the cutting board, which we use for, let's say, you cut ginger, cut garlic, all of that. Now, what's going to happen is the chicken is going to be cooked, so the bacteria will die, but the salad and the and the other parts may not be cooked. For example, you you cut tomatoes and onions for your salad or cucumbers, the bacteria are going to sit there. So that is why it is universally um, considered wrong uh, to cut uh, vegetarian and non-vegetarian using the same utensil. So these are two important messages. A, if you're making more portions, uh, store it in the fridge right away as soon as the steam is, uh, steam is out. Second is separate vegetarian and non-vegetarian cutting boards and utensils. Uh, is there a type of food that it's more likely to come from? Like, for instance, is non-vegetarian food more likely to contain bacteria than others now there is no such thing uh, any food can potentially be contaminated uh, i'll take you through a rare case uh, this happened uh, i believe in some of our army um, quarters uh, a, a few years ago 
uh, apparently when they were running short of uh, rations for whatever reason maybe there was a there was a problem with transportation with snowfall etc uh, some people decided to harvest locally grown leaves uh, and use it as a uh, as a sabji they all got poisoned with atropa atropa belladonna atropa belladonna as you know contains atropine and it can kill uh, it is uh, so so that this is this was recorded um, uh, if we if we take salads for example salads can be contaminated with manure so remember what does manure contain it contains fecal bacteria so salads can easily be splashed on uh, say lettuce lettuce can easily be splashed on and get contaminated by e coli which is which is seen in the manure that's used to um, used as fertilizer the same thing with onions and the same thing with fish and meat and so on so any food substance can potentially get contaminated and uh, one other potential source are wild mushrooms. People have, uh, have become horribly sick after consuming wild mushrooms. So, um, but, the, but the bottom line is, if we stick to known ingredients and if we stick to basic uh, food hygiene techniques, it's extremely unlikely that any of these events will actually occur. But it's always good uh, to keep safety measures in mind. One other potential source of contamination is um, our eggs and milk. Eggs often contain a little bit of dirt on the shell, and that comes from, uh, uh, you know, from the from the chickens, um, uh, from where they keep the chickens' cage, and it can contain salmonella. And um, when we crack the egg, remember, when we crack the egg, we seldom wash the eggshell, even though it's recommended. We seldom wash the eggshell, and the the end cont contents of the egg can actually ooze over the surface of the egg. It's it's impossible to crack an egg without without doing that. If bacteria are there, yes, they can enter your egg um, egg bowl. And uh, since we cook the egg, it will not be a problem. But there are, for example, in the instances in Kerala, the recent food poisonings involve homemade mayonnaise. Now, homemade mayonnaise, what they call mayonnaise is they mix um, eggs, uh, raw eggs, uh, um, sunflower oil, garlic, and vinegar in a mixi and serve it along with um, with the salads and meat. So it makes a delicious dip, but remember it's a raw product. So these are potential sources of contamination. The commonest bacterium that contaminates this particular product are non-typhoidal salmonella. So in other words, there is no single food that is more prone for food poisoning. But since the recent episodes were concerning a form of, uh, within quotes, Arabic style of uh, grilled meat that's become extremely popular in Kerala in the past couple of years. Um, half cooked meat uh, is actually an excellent culture medium. So this particular type of cooking involves a large block of meat, chicken meat. Uh, it looks um, it looks like a cylinder, maybe about a foot wide, maybe it may be conical, and it's cooked from the outside using a grill. So which means that the inside part of the block of meat is raw or uncooked. And uh, since it's cooked on the outside, when we take food, when we shave the cooked meat from the outside, it is it's okay, it is safe. But if you shave too hard, and if there's a large order and you shave a little bit deeper into the block, you may end up uh, shaving off some partially cooked meat, which if contaminated, uh, might not be healthy uh, for you in more ways than one. So those are all potential problems. Uh, so as I said, this type of food itself is not unsafe. It just depends on the way it's handled. Uh, so you had uh, a Twitter thread on this and you had explained in that that the shawarma meat is already contaminated when it's being assembled. It's an excellent culture for bacteria. I mean, um, culture medium for bacteria. So what should restaurants and consumers watch out for? Okay. Now, uh, what I wrote was that there's a possibility that if the block is assembled by unscrupulous people, in unhygienic surroundings, yes, the block could come contaminated um, even before delivery. So that's the point. But a block that is hygienically assembled will not be contaminated and it's perfectly safe if handled properly. So it's important to, dis to distinguish between the two. So uh, as, as a consumer, see, I like to eat out and I particularly enjoy uh, different types of cuisines, regardless of um, whether the eatery is small, roadside, large or expensive uh, that's something i've enjoyed ever since my college days that's just my personal perspective so what i'll tell you what i do um, in terms of 
as a as a medical doctor as well as somebody with vast experience uh, with eating outdoors also from multiple nations the first thing i would look for is is it a known um, restaurant chain which is established with certain protocols in place see uh, certain brands are brands for a reason because they have um, what what what's called a mission statement and strict enforcement of protocols which are basic hygiene measures for example the chef is expected to wash his or her hands after using the washroom and that's a universal hygiene principle but if you ask the set always happen i'm afraid that doesn't always happen if you look at some of the toilets in india how many of them actually have a wash basin inside the toilet there are countless wash uh, washrooms that i've seen that do not have a wash basin inside uh, the um, inside the room so likewise if uh, if these standards are met properly uh, i don't see a problem so that's one but then we can't always look for an established food chain the second thing is does this place have a reputation good reputation say if, if it's within your neighborhood that you're planning to eat out we, we would tend to eat out in places that are safe and clean and have a good record and we all know what those places are that almost never get into any trouble the third thing i would do is to see if that place uh, has a lot of people if that place is frequented by people uh, i would feel safer ordering food from there and therein lies a caveat if i go into an unfamiliar place with a lot of people i would not pick the most exotic rarely ordered item on their menu many restaurants have a very large menu and they may they may list exotic dishes which are seldom prepared and if i order a rare dish chances are there's a good chance that the ingredients they use are not regularly used so you know what i'm getting at so i would in to put it another way i would order what everyone else is ordering the most commonly used if if one place is ordering if if they're having say tandoori naan and uh, if all the all the nearby plates are having mutter paneer i'll say you know i'll have some of that it is safer whereas if i order something very exotic off the menu uh, i may end up in a bit of trouble the, the third thing i would look at is regardless of how clean the immediate settings are i would look around is that food joint located in a filthy uh, looking environment is there a is there a drain that's emanating a strange stench Uh, which suggests a blocked drain or even rotting uh, garbage. Uh, we simply do not know that, which is why I said, don't be fooled by a clean table or a clean plate or a or an air conditioned um, room where food is served. What really matters is where the food is assembled and where the food is cooked. And what I would be reassured um, by um, is one other factor that reassures me would be an open kitchen if i see an open kitchen and if i see the chef washing his or her hands i'd feel very happy i'll know that um, you know the fact that they 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 are keeping an open kitchen tells me that they're not afraid uh, for uh, to show their standards to people so those are those are some tips and uh, for um, for completion i'll say this you could look for the certification certification of the restaurant Uh, FSS AI gives a certificate, and you can ask for that to be shown. And many good restaurants will will display it directly in front, so you don't have to ask for it. Now, if they if they're not going to show you the certification, which is not current, also check the date. If it's not current, if they are showing some um, reluctance in showing you the certification, I would just walk from there. But I don't lose anything by missing a meal. No one's going to die because they missed a meal. we also have a number of checks now being conducted by the food safety commission and a number of restaurants have been closed and some places are also losing licenses like you just said so do you think all that will be helpful or is there something more that should be done uh well awareness is one thing that is you know cultivating good awareness uh, about how food is prepared handled delivered and consumed that's one in parallel to that there must be enforcement uh for example if you look at road safety i work in road safety for 10 years i worked on road safety see so you can create all the awareness you want but if there are no checks by the police people would do what they want some people will st- might still follow what is uh, what 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 is what i call safe road behavior others will not they'll their excuse will be that there's no there's no fine for not doing that so it's okay um typical example is helmet use everyone knows that on a two wheeler you ought to wear a helmet 
but they'll say the common man may say look you know they're not finding i heard they're not finding people anymore for not wearing a helmet so i'm not going to wear it that attitude can prevail in the food industry as well so if there's no enforcement it may be taken by at least by a few individuals as a license uh, to deviate uh, from uh, protocol and um, take shortcuts in um, in due course these shortcuts will lead to safety lapses and these safety lapses eventually will lead to episodes like what we discussed earlier and many such episodes eventually will lead to a fatal outcome uh, which happened in kerala um, a few days ago uh, to a nurse to an icu nurse her name was rashmi she was only 33 uh, she worked at kottayam medical college she died as a result of consuming uh, the um, this, this particular food product now again this is not a um an appeal to uh, stop using these products it's it's about using um about being about being cautious uh, about cultivating awareness and also for people in enforcement to realize that customers go to a restaurant with trust and uh, for that trust to be maintained there has to be enforcement and if there are barriers to enforcement for example with personnel that has to be fixed as well that's all doctor thank you so much thank you thank you